there is something about the Psalms that I think linguistically puts fuel on the fire in my soul. This must be coming out of my classical theater or, or even my Shakespearean background, uh, is the poetry of the Psalms. And just in case you weren't aware or a reminder, in case you hadn't heard in a while, that the Psalms, all 150 of them, is the Bible's very own built-in hymn book. These were songs, and they were played with musical accompaniment, and they were sung. Some of them, uh, there's a, a series of them, in fact, they were sung every Passover, the, the Psalms of Ascent. They were a series that the pilgrims, so to speak, would sing as they were heading up to the temple every Passover. They were part of the inbuilt liturgy of God's own people written across uh, centuries. So we turn to Psalm 101. Let's look at the text, and then the first thing I will do is I will provide you with the background around which this was written. I thought that this was very apropos, particularly as we close out 2023 and look, well, even tomorrow, at 2024, a brand new year. Psalm 101, a psalm of David. I will sing of steadfast love and justice. To you, O Lord, I will make music. I will ponder the way that is blameless. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. I will not set my eyes, or I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall be far from me. I will know nothing of evil. Whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. I will look with favor on the faithful in the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in the way that is blameless shall minister to me. No one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. No one who utters lies shall continue before my eyes. Morning by morning, I will destroy all the wicked in the land, cutting off all the evildoers from the city of the Lord. Amen. Braden, that's an interesting choice for New Year's. Well, take a look, and I hope that you're not adverse to being one of those who either takes notes or even perhaps underlines or circles certain things in your Bible. I have this repeated phrase underlined again and again and again and again throughout this psalm, and maybe you heard it in the reading of it. I will, I will sing of your steadfast love. I will make music. I will ponder. I will walk. I will, here's a negative, I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I will know nothing of evil. I will destroy. I will, I will, I will. It's the practice, has become the practice, to make New Year's resolutions, isn't it? Now, I often say my sermon research sometimes takes me into very interesting, sometimes very strange places. Uh, I once did a, once researched the history of wedding dresses uh, to talk about why is the bride dressed in white? Where did that all come from? Uh, but this week, it was the history of New Year's resolutions. Uh, they actually go back probably a lot further than you may think. They actually date back to... Uh, at least as far as historians can tell, the ancient Babylonians. Now, the ancient Babylonians, their new year was in the middle of summer. They had it at the other equinox, uh, which is in June. And at that, they were a largely um, different climate than we are in a largely uh, agricultural society. So at the beginning of their new year, which is right in the middle of planting and harvesting, they made a resolution that if they had borrowed any agricultural equipment, they would return it. And then when the fall would roll around, those rightful owners would have what they needed to go and harvest their fields. So the ancient Babylonians were resolved to return borrowed equipment and uh, farm implements, and they did this in the middle of a 12-day New Year's festival that they had in the, uh, in the midsummer. Flash forward several centuries. Now, this was also the Babylonian New Year. Now, the Babylonian New Year gets appropriated by the Roman Empire because Rome never met a culture it didn't want to steal from. 
That's why all of the Roman gods, if you've ever noticed, they, with a few name changes, bear striking resemblance to the Greek gods. Jupiter is just Zeus, and they all have Romanized names. Well, Rome needed some gods, and there's a perfectly good set of gods over here in Greece, so we conquered Greece and we stole their gods. But we Romanized them to make them brand new. This is what Rome did. Rome was the ultimate in uh, the ultimate uh, criminal in terms of uh, cultural appropriation, and they appropriated the Babylonian New Year. So they also appropriated with it the idea of making resolutions. Now this lasts until the Emperor Julian, who introduces the Julian calendar, and decided that in the month of January, that was now going to be the New Year. So the resolutions move from midsummer to the beginning of January. Still with me? Good. Now, we're making resolutions, and now they're in the winter instead of the summer. And that's why we have a new year when we have a new year. This continued then, after the collapse of Rome, into the Middle Ages. Now, I said my research takes me to strange and interesting places, and this was definitely one of them. Now we're in the Middle Ages. It's the, it's the era of castles and knights, and of course the code of chivalry, which is the uh, line and rule for all of those knights. And so at the dawn of the new year, said knights would renew their oaths to the chivalric code. And they would do so by laying hands on a peacock. I told you. It was actually called the peacock. Now, I, I, first off, I question, you know, it's 1405. Where did we get all the peacocks from? But they would lay hands on a peacock and they would make, it was literally called the peacock vow. They would reaffirm this chivalric code, the code of chivalry that they swore to live by, and they would renew their dedication to it. Flash forward again, several centuries. Now it's the 1600s. People have now picked up on this practice. New Year's resolutions are now so common. In the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, they're now so common that in, the la in a previous century, people actually joked about the making and the breaking of them because everybody makes a New Year's resolutions, don't we? You want to know how many years I have sworn I'm going to get to the gym? This is it. This is the year. Yeah, okay, so I'm not alone, right? Right? New year, new me, as my daughter would say, right? In fact, Jim, Jim seems to be a big one because we all, we, none of us like 100% what we see in the mirror. Jim's make a killing during the month of January from that one month trial period. And then in February, the attendance drops right off. People make them, and we, we continue to make them. And we make them knowing we're going to break them. And we're not new in this attitude. This is from a Boston newspaper. It was published in 1813. Quote, so I guess this is part of an editorial. Quote, and yet I believe there are multitudes of people accustomed to receive injunctions of New Year's resolutions who will sin all the month of December then with serious determination of beginning the new year with resolutions and new behavior and with all the full belief that they shall thus expiate and wipe away their former faults, close quote. In other words, it's not January yet, so I'm going to live like there's no tomorrow until January 1st. And then I'm totally going to clean up my act. I'm going to stop drinking so much, eating so much, hit the gym. I'm going to be a better father, better wife. I'm going to improve myself, right? That's what the resolutions have become. It's all about self-improvement. Long gone are the days of renewing my oath to a code, even if I have to lay hands on a peacock. To do it. That was 1813. By the way, that is also the first recorded phrase of uh, the term New Year's resolution. That's where we get it from some Boston newspaper in a previous century. So we make them, uh, maybe we make them for fun, maybe they do start off with serious intent. But I'm willing to ad admit and I'm willing also to believe that the number of resolutions that get made on December 31st to January 1st and are actually still in place a year later. Actually, research, you'd, you'd think maybe they crash and burn a lot. Research has shown that at least 60% of people who make a New Year's resolution are still following through in some way, shape, or form a year later. So it's not entirely bad, but that still leaves almost half who make a resolution and then end up not following through. Why? Well, there's a lot of reasons. First off, it's really, uh, I love carbs, and I love sugars, 
And I really, the men's Bible study will attest, I really love sugary carbs. I never met a donut I didn't care for. And I knew, I actually knew one of the dangers of going into pastoral ministry. This is my thinking years ago. I was like, well, there's a danger. Little old ladies are going to want to feed me squares. Every time I go, every, every function I go to, there will be sweets. And there are, and I love them. But the, the resolution part is hard to stick to it, to limit yourself, to exercise. Now, here's a biblical thought. Self-restraint and control. That's hard. It's easy to swear a vow. It really is, even if you find a peacock. It's really easy to proclaim, this is the year I'm going to do it. But the actual year of doing it, that's often difficult. And a good 40% of us just flame out. There was one man, however, I'd like to introduce you to this morning, who took the idea of resolutions very seriously. And we should be emulating him. His name is Jonathan Edwards, an American theologian of uh, a century even before this Boston newspaper article. Now, Jonathan Edwards is widely regarded as one of, if not the, finest theological mind that the United States has ever produced or is likely ever to produce. He had that very particular kind of genius and intellect and power and conviction that comes along maybe once in a generation, if you're lucky. He stands now as a towering figure, not just in American history, but in American church history and all of church history. But it was not always such. At one time, believe it or not, even Jonathan Edwards was 18 years old. And when he was 18 years old, he found himself thrust into the position of being a pastor, something I can somewhat uh, sympathize with. Sometimes you don't go looking for this calling, the calling finds you. And when he was 18, turning 19, Jonathan Edwards found himself in New York City. Now where in New York City is a bit of an uh, issue of debate. I have uh, read that his, the church that he was given charge of was down by the harbor. I've also heard that it is about where Broadway, um, Broadway and Wall Street is currently, so, but he's on the island of Manhattan, he's 18 years old, there's been a large Presbyterian church that has split, and they said, John, Jonathan, you have these people over here, they're largely homeless, and you are really just a kid. So facing this calling, facing this charge, this daunting charge at the age of 18, for about this year, 18 into when he was 19, before he became Jonathan Edwards, young Jonathan Edwards set himself his very own version of a peacock code and oath. They're called the resolutions. I wanted to print off a copy for each of you this morning, but there are 70 of them, and even at 10-point font, it's five pages long. If you want a copy, please let them know out in the lobby, and I will make sure that you have one for next week. But what young Jonathan Edwards did is that he kept a journal. And he, over the course of this year, set down for himself 70, 70 resolutions. And then strove with all his heart, soul, strength, and might to keep them, not just for a year, but for all of his years. This is 1771 to 17, no, 1772, sorry, to 1773, somewhere in amongst that. And he kept them for all those years. When his church grew, when he was there for 20 years, when that congregation eventually fired him, if you can imagine there, yes, a church fired Jonathan Edwards. Why? Oh, because he took a radical stance on who is allowed to come to the Lord's table. When he went to Princeton, I'm pretty sure it was Princeton in New Jersey, before it was called Princeton, before he wrote the books, before he did all of that. He was an 18-year-old at the beginning of a new phase in his life. And he knew, I have to fence myself in. And I have to have something concrete that I can return to again and again and again. And so over the course of a year, as I said, he set down 70 resolutions. Now, a lot of us would struggle just to come up with maybe five for the new year. He has 70 for life. I want to share a couple of them with you. Actually, let's start with uh, the first one. Resolved. And they all start resolved. And he's not just saying, this is the year I'm going to get in shape. 
Although, to his credit, twice in the 70, he talks about eating and drinking. I'm going to watch what I do it. I'm going to do it only to the glory of God. They all start resolved, as in, this I swear, that type of elevated thought. This I promise to myself. If ever I am slack, it is to this I will return. Resolved. Here's the very first one. Remember, he's 18. Resolved. That I will do whatever I think to be most to God's glory and my own good profit and pleasure in the whole of my duration without any consideration of the time, whether now or never so many myriads of ages hence, whether I live 10 years or 50 years, he's saying, I will always do all things to God's glory. Resolved, this is still part of the same one, resolved to do whatever I think to be my duty and most for the good and advantage of mankind in general. It's a resolution not just for himself, but for his neighbors. Resolved to do this, whatever difficulties I meet with, how many soever, and how great soever. As I said, there's 70. I've gone through them. They are all starting with the word resolved. And if you... As I say, swore them at the beginning of a new year, easy to do. If you were still doing them a year later, difficult. If you were still doing them decades later, very difficult. What was it, what is it that elevated Jonathan Edwards to become Jonathan Edwards, this towering historic figure? It was this dedication to following Christ and glorifying God. If you go through this list, it is the singular focus. That's why, number one, I wanted to read out to you. There, he actually included a preamble, if you'll allow me to share that, before launching into these. And maybe the preamble says more than anything in the list does. This is Jonathan Edwards, quote, Being sensible that I am unable to do anything without God's help, I do humbly entreat him by his grace to enable me to keep these resolutions so far as they are agreeable to his will for Christ's sake. Before he even gets to the list, he acknowledges his own fleshly weakness, his own human tendency to make and then break a bunch of promises, and then says, whatever I do promise, let it be more for him and less for me, more for my neighbor, less for myself. No matter what I promise and stick to, may it glorify God, or else let me not do it. I mean, the preamble itself is worthy of every single Christian, including myself, mostly Paul, myself, to keep in mind at the dawning of a new year. As 2024 dawns, Lord, let me do everything to your glory and service. And if it's not to your glory and service, don't let me do it or let me stop. That's much more powerful a resolution, isn't it? Resolved that I will follow Christ no matter what. Right? Whatever difficulties, however great they are. By the way, there's a couple more that I wanted to... Number nine. This may speak to some of you or someone this morning. Resolved. Keep in mind, he's, he's 18. Okay? Resolved to think much on all occasions of my own dying and of the common circumstances which attend death. At 18, he's about to start leading a church. He doesn't know what the future brings. He could be dead tomorrow. I resolve each and every day to keep my own limited lifespan, which God has given me foremost in mind. Why? Well, you'll see as you go through the list, so that he lives each day to its fullest for God's glory. He does not put things off. He's also keeping his mind on the end of the race, isn't he? Whatever happens around me, whatever, when my own church fires me two decades from now because I made the daring claim that the Lord's table is for believers, when my church fires me and I am at my lowest, I will continue to keep my eye on heaven's shores. And I will know that as grievesome as this instant in my life may be, the king is waiting to welcome me home. Number 10, resolved, I thought of this one, this is for me this week, at least, resolved, when I feel pain, to think of the pains of martyrdom and of hell. 
Did my neck and shoulders cripple me on Christmas Day? Yes, I was lying on my living room floor at one point. It hurt so much. Did it hurt more than those who went, say, to the flames so that the Bible could be translated into English? Not by a long shot. Hell lasts forever. My shoulder, I took a couple of Advil and felt better. Eternity puts a lot of things in perspective. We make resolutions with one year in mind. We should be following after Edwards and David. We'll get to his text in a moment. But we should be making them with forever in mind. Make a resolution with forever in mind. I'm going to follow Christ so that when I arrive before heaven's throne, he says to me, well done, good and faithful servant. There's a resolution worth making. How about this, number 41, resolves to ask myself at the end, note this, at the end of every day, week, month, and year, wherein I could possibly in any respect have done better. Constant evaluation, re-evaluation. What else? 63. Oh, okay. Yeah, 63. It's a bit wordy, but I'll explain. On the supposition that there was never to be but one individual in the world at any one time who was properly a complete Christian in all respects of a right stamp, having Christianity always shining in its true luster and appearing excellent and lovely from whatever part and under whatever character viewed. Okay, he sets this one up with a preamble. Let's just assume, hypothetically, that there is one person in every generation in all the world who is a Christian and a shining example of Christ and what it is to follow Christ. Let's say that there was one Christian in the whole world resolved to act just as I would do if I strove with all my might to be that one who should live in my time. That was January 14th. He repeated that one, actually. January 14th and July 13th, 1723. Let's assume there's one Christian in the world I want to be that one Christian. Let's assume there's one shining example of the church in the world, of the Savior in the world. If there was to be one representative of the kingdom of heaven in all the world, Jonathan Edwards said, I want to be that. It's very much in the spirit, I thought, and made a note of the Olympic athlete, yes? The gold medal winner. I want to be the best long jumper in the world in my day. If there's one long jumper, one swimmer, one javelin thrower, one skeet shooter, think of all the different summer and winter Olympic sports, there's one gold medal. You are the best in this time, in this place, even in this generation. And some of these records, remember, some some Olympic records will stand for generations. Some will never be broken. Imagine that there was an Olympics for being a Christ follower. Don't you want the gold medal? Wouldn't you want at the end of the race to be given the victor's laurel like they did? Well, that takes, here are my two underlined, highlighted notes, conviction and diligence. That's our call this morning and every morning, but particularly here at the end of uh, one year and the dawning of a new one, to be an effective, useful, and yes, even blessed man or woman of God requires conviction and diligence. And that's why I read you the one about constantly revisiting from Jonathan Edwards, constant vigilance. You ready to come to the text? I sure am. Why Psalm 101? It's a psalm about resolutions. Now, here's the history about where this is being written. It's actually in uh, Second Sam. No, it is in. Sorry, wrong page. David has just become king. Second Samuel. This is. Uh, I think it's Second Samuel. Second Samuel five. David becomes king. I'm going to turn to it. I want to show you the text. Yes, 2 Samuel 5. Now, David has been anointed king twice before this, but this is really his coronation, we could say. Remember, he's anointed king, and then he has all the, but there's still a king in the land in Saul. They have all their, 
all their history between them, Saul has died, finally. By the time we get to 2 Samuel 5, Saul is dead. His family is mostly dead. It is now time for David to step up and, uh, as, as we would envision it, finally claim the crown, claim the throne. So at 2 Samuel 5, these are the circumstances around which we will be written Psalm 101. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and flesh. We are your subjects. In times past when Saul was king over us, it was you who led out and brought in Israel. And the Lord said to you, You shall be a shepherd of my people, Israel, and you shall be prince over Israel. Verse 3, so all the elders of Israel came to the king, which is David now, at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. Psalm 101 is David's covenant to his people at the dawn of his kingship, which he makes not just before the crowds, but also before Almighty God. And that is why, going back to 101, it is a, a psalm, a praise song as much as it is a promise and pledge it is his very own peacock code i will i will i will not i will you could very easily and i think just as legitimately swap out the word resolved resolved or included i will sing verse one i will sing of steadfast Love and justice, in a very general sense? No, very specifically, to you, O Lord, right at the top. I will praise the Lord. Yes, I am now king. Yes, I was once a shepherd. Yes, I have even spent time as a military leader and a refugee. Yes, I remember when I hid in caves and feared for my life. I remember all of this. And now that I have the victory, now that they are metaphorically, or maybe even physically, about to put a crown on my head, now that I am the top man in all the land. Resolved, I will praise my Lord who saw me through, and I will always ask him to continue to see me through. You see? It's not of self, it's heavenward. I will sing of steadfast love and justice to you, O Lord. I will make music. I will praise you. I will praise you when I am alone. I will praise you in the assembly. I will praise you. Verse 2, resolved, yes? I will ponder the way that is blameless. I will study your law. When I sit and think about my, this is my alone devotional time, we might say. I will think about righteousness. I will think about that which is impure in me. I will think about that in my flesh which wants to rebel against you, and then I will kill it. I will mortify it. And instead, I will intentionally and continually redirect my focus to you and the path of righteousness. I will ponder the way that is blameless. This is an interesting little, oh, when will you come to me? I'm not sure what he was thinking when he included that. But in my mind, it goes back to Jonathan Edwards resolving to always think about his death. My life is finite. Number nine, think on all occasions of my own dying. There will be a day when the angel, or the Lord himself, will come for David, and he knows this. I may be king now. This is great. But my days are numbered. When will you come to me? I don't know if that's what he had in mind. That's, that's what strikes me. I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. Verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, make a note this morning. He starts all of this, his own code, his list of resolutions, it's all personal. From 5 to 8, it is then interpersonal. But he starts with myself. Because if I'm not in the right place, if I haven't got the right personal guidelines to return to again and again, if I haven't made these oaths and these promises both to myself, to my people, and to my Lord and God, then there's all, all of my interpersonal relationships are going to be skewed. It starts with ourselves, and it starts at home. I will ponder the way that is blameless. I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. Parents, this one's for you. Are you being the exemplar in your family circle? Are you walking with integrity? Maybe in the face of and despite what all the other members of your family, even your own children are doing. Are you remaining above it all, 
resolute, blameless? Are you exemplifying Christ? Either to be an inspirational example to them or perhaps to shame them. Walk with integrity of heart within my house. I will not, verse 3, I will not. Here's the first negative. I promise, I swear, I will not. Be it resolved. I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. These are the time wasters. All the distractions of life. In fact, he goes on, I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. Those who profess to worship and follow and then fall away, I will not be dragged off into the ditch with them. I will stand resolute. A perverse heart shall be far from me. I will know nothing of evil. Oh, we could just camp on that this morning, couldn't we? Resolved. In 2024, I will know nothing of evil. I will put away the time wasters. I will walk with integrity in every circle in which I find myself, be it my home, my school, my work, wherever it is. And when the world tries to say, do this, when the world tries to entice me to compromise, I will plant my feet and say, no. Fire me if you must. Discipline me if you must. Take away my benefits if, if you must. But I am resolved to follow the Lord and know nothing of evil. Well, now that he's got his own house in order, his own heart in order, he moves into the interpersonal relationships from which these will flow. Verse 5, whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. These are whisperers. These are busybodies. These are gossipers. And I circled the word destroy here because I had some problems with this one. Uh, is David saying as king it will be a death sentence, uh, slanderers? You're done? No. Uh, when you go into Hebrew, just to quickly let you know, uh, in brackets I have penciled in silence twice in the Old Testament this word, and it can mean destroy. It's not being used in that term uh, in, in that exact way here. Um, the modern parlance, the Braden Campbell translation would be, whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will silence. When he encounters slander, he will shut it down, and he will not partake in it. He's not going to be a gossip. He's not going to be a busybody. He won't go off half-cocked. Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. They're not going to have any place. Remember, this is David at the beginning of his government. Wrongdoers, slanderers, they will have no place at my side, he says. Now, you don't have to be a king to come alongside and say that I'm going to keep my company pure. And you should. We all should. Bad company perverts good morals, yes? Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I don't call them friend. They're not in my entourage. I will look, instead, I will look with favor on the faithful in the land. Those are the people I want to get to know. Those are the people I want in my circle. Those are the people I want at my side. And look at this. They will dwell with me. He who walks in the way that is blameless shall minister to me. Those are the people I want. I know, will not only come alongside them. Those are the people I want coming alongside me. This is so fascinating to me, given what we know will happen to David in all the years to come. Is that here at the onset, and even in this great gold medal, crown upon the head moment, he acknowledges, I'm not perfect yet to help prevent me from sliding into any of these things that I have already stated I do not want to have a part of. I must have people around me. I must have people minister to me. I must have men and women of experience to come alongside and tell me, you don't want to go here, I know. I must have people of my own level of experience that we can link arms and strengthen one another. Let me broadcast this into the New Testament. I must have a local church. I must have a family of God around me. You can't do this in your living room. And that church that I mentioned earlier that canceled service, couched it in the lamest of terms, because again, Sunday falls on the 31st, uh, that they were being intentional about having uh, worship in, you know, in their living rooms and amongst their families. No, you just, you're lazy. You don't want to come to church because it's New Year's Eve. Just admit it. Find Paul, and I, in fact, I told all those people, come to Ajax Baptist, we'll be singing some hymns. Right? Intentionality. This takes discipline. 
It takes discipline. You want to be the Christian in your generation? You want to be the gold medal winner? You're going to have to work for it. And this should not come as a surprise to any one of us. It's the same thing that Paul says. Make a note or turn to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians, uh, here, my sticky note. 1 Corinthians 9, at the end of this chapter. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. Listen to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, right? Okay, if there's one man in a generation who's going to be the Christian, who's going to get the gold medal, who's going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant when he strides through heaven's archways, it's got to be the Apostle Paul, right? Listen to what he himself says. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. You want the gold medal? Work for it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. You didn't get a gold medal, you got a, an olive wreath in Greece. In fact, when the Romans first came to Greece and saw how hard athletes worked and trained and performed to win a branch, they were stunned. They could we thought, really? Is there at least money involved? No, no, no. It's, it's this olive leaf and honor. They were stunned. But that's what Paul's talking about. I'm not doing this for tangible earthly rewards. I'm not doing this for the love and affection of the general populace or book deals or... Uh, here's, here's my constant temptation, you know, to be, to be a well-known, globally known evangelistic name and you get invited to all the talk shows. No, that's not the goal. That's perishable. We seek a reward that is imperishable. So, it gets personal. Verse 26, the Apostle Paul, remember. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. It's a very interesting turn of phrase. He, uh, shadow boxing. He's not just fighting nothing. He's not just hitting no target. He's not just practicing emptily. He is looking at something in terms of boxing. I'm looking at a target and I am connecting with it. So I do not, and I, when I run, let's employ this marathon metaphor, I'm not just running over here and then over here and over here. I have an end goal and I run towards that. And I do not let things deviate me off the path of that. I don't run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. I discipline my body and keep it under control. Some translation, maybe you got the KGV. I beat, I beat my body to keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. It takes discipline. It takes, and here's a dirty word in so much of the contemporary Canadian church, conviction. To borrow from an American teacher and poet, what has happened to our convictions? Where are the limbs upon which we once so confidently strode? We need to find them again, and there's no better day on which to find them than the dawning of the new year. Here's our supplementary. You think it's Paul? No, it's Peter. And we read this heading into the service. Verse 5. For this very reason, thinking about our salvation, thinking about our newness of life in Christ, thinking about how we have been ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. With all of that in mind, that's the starting point. What's the end goal? Well, between there and heaven's shores, and because of our salvation, for this very reason, this is for 2 Peter 1.5, make every effort to supplement your faith with Virtue, and then knowledge, and self-control, and steadfastness, and godliness, and brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Every effort, every morning, every day, every week, at the end of every year, Jonathan Edwards checked in. Where did I fall short? Where can I improve? Resolved. Boy, I mean, even this would make a wonderful list, wouldn't it? Not resolved, I'm going to eat fewer donuts. By the way, I'm going to try to eat fewer donuts. Lord, yeah, with, with, with the Lord's help. How about this? Resolved. In 2024, to supplement my faith with virtue. How about this? Resolved. 
in 2024 to supplement my virtue with knowledge and my knowledge with self-control. And my self-control with steadfastness and my steadfastness with godliness. How about that? How about resolved to be more like Christ come one year from now when we're looking down the barrel at 2025 and I do my year-end review? Am I more like Jesus than I was a year ago? Is this church more representative of the heavenly kingdom to which it has been called to be an ambassador to the town of Ajax? Are we further along the walk? Are we closer to the end of the race? Or did we waste our time? Verse 7 here, back to David. No one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. Again, back to family, back to interpersonal relationships. No one who utters lies shall continue before my eyes. Morning by morning I will destroy, same verb, I will silence, I will put a stop to, I will shut down all the wicked in the land. Now this one, this use of this verb in Hebrew is more intentional. I will, because he's king, because he's also acting as the purifier and the top policeman in the land, we could say, he will seek out wickedness in the land and he will root it out. He will destroy it. He will punish it. He will address it. He will shut it down. He will make sure that it does not propagate. He will cut off all the evildoers from the city of the Lord. He's going to purify his people as king. Now, how did this work out for David? Uh, meh, he said with a wavering of his hand. In fact, again, talking about my social media feeds, the issue of David raped Bathsheba comes up so frequently and so often that myself and other pastors jokingly refer to it now as bathsheba tide. It rolls around again. And in fact, another man I argued with just a few days ago Again, wanted to impugn the character and the righteousness of David. Now, he was not perfect. And talking about Bathsheba, maybe one of the greatest of his transgressions, you can make a note of Psalm 51, because we believe that this was written after the prophet Nathan comes and says that whole great scene, you were the man, and his child falls sick, and the child dies as heaven's retribution and just punishment for what David has done. Now, David didn't keep all of these perfectly all the time, which is why in Psalm 51 he ends up writing, much later, much later on in time, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. The fact that he didn't carry through all of these I will, all of these resolved statements, however, does in no way, shape, or form mean that they were pointless or wastes of time. Just an acknowledgement that he's still a man. And there was one great resolution that even he fell back on time and time again. It was the promises of God and the loving mercy in his holiness that we can depend on whether we are abiding to our resolutions or whether we are falling short of them. How about this? Resolved in 2024 to dwell peacefully in God's mercy. That no matter what tumults or buffets or situations may come when I feel pain, as Edward says, when I think about death or whether there is death around me in a world that is God-hating, in a world that wants me to compromise, in a world and even our own government and authorities who hate God. When all these things pull me in a hundred different directions, and sometimes I may to some degree or another get swept along when I return resolved, I will dwell in the knowledge that God is loving and powerful and merciful for every prodigal to return. I will dwell in the transformed and transformative power of the gospel. How about that for a resolution? I will live 2024 resolved as a child of God, given newness of life in Christ, 
And I will hold my head high whether I succeed or backslide or need to come crawling back and self-evaluate. No matter my lot or place, I will continue to live and find comfort and reassurance in the mercy of God. And I will seek his righteousness. What was number 70, you might ask? Or towards the end? Well... Number 68 is maybe noteworthy, resolved to confess frankly to myself all that which I find in myself, either infirmity or sin, and if it be what concerns religion, also to confess the whole case to God and implore needed help. I will constantly throw myself and live in his mercy. And I will come to him in continual forgiveness. Look, our, our first John Bible study has already touched on this, haven't we? If anybody says that they have no sin in them, they're a liar. The truth of God is not in them. This is 1 John 1. However, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he, meaning God, he is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and the word is not in us. Why don't we start the new year by confessing our sins to one another? Why don't we start the new year in a time of quiet contemplation or even family devotions to God saying, we know that we have not been what you have called us to be this past year. Strengthen us to be better in the year to come. And among all things, resolved, I will uplift Christ and his holy name both in my life and in all my different kinds of interpersonal relationships, till he call me home, and to do so with direct, intentional conviction and diligence. Father God, as we come to the close of one year and the dawn of a new, I pray for all the people, whether they're here this morning or traveling elsewhere, joining us virtually, whether they hear me today or in the days to come, my prayer is the same for each and every one of them, that you would strengthen them to be ever more like your Son, their Savior, our Lord, Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, in a world that is full of all the things that we should turn our back to. Help us turn our back to them. Help us to remain strong and resolute. And never let us become so prideful or so conceited or so haughty that we refrain from constant and continual and honest self-evaluation. We are running a race. We are fighting a war. We are in a competition. We are laboring for the kingdom. Help us at all times, and you have helped us in giving us one another, but continue to come alongside us in the year to come that we may not labor in vain, that we may not go off in the wrong directions, that we may not beat the air, Help us with our convictions, renew the fire within us, and renew the knowledge of what is true and what is not within each and every one of us, so that we may be sharper blades, more effective tools, and ever more Christ-like witnesses to a world that so desperately needs to know him, and repent and flee to him as their only Savior and Lord. We thank you for the year that has about to wrap up, and Lord, we are resolved this morning we will do all in the year to come to your service and your glory. Amen.